All right, it looks like we are recording and I want to welcome everybody here to our 100th anniversary gala. Anniversary. Oh, good. Somebody knew, okay, that's good. Um, <laughs> Hi Beth, welcome. Um, so if you uh, had asked me a year ago what we'd be doing on January 8th, 2021, I would have told you with uh, much confidence that we would have be having a giant catered event at uh, South Carolina Society Hall and had Terrence Hayes as our, our guest speaker. And there was no doubt about it back in those, those days before COVID. But these are unprecedented times uh, to use an overused word. Um, so what we're doing instead is we're celebrating our 100th anniversary with uh, a lecture by, uh, well, a discussion by Harlan Green, who's a um, historian who's written uh, extensively about the Charleston Renaissance. Um, we are the oldest poetry society, state poetry society, in the United States. And uh, so we, we're very proud of that. We want to show it off. Um, Harlan Green is a Charleston native, and he has worked for the South Carolina Historical Society, the Special Collections at the Charleston County Library, the Avery Institute, and currently at the College of Charleston Special Collections at the Addlestone Library. And those are just the institutions he's worked at in Charleston. He's the author of three novels of historical fiction and the author or co-author of four books of nonfiction, including, got it right here, the definitive biography of John Bennett, one of our founders. In fact, I think the only biography of John Bennett. Um, he also co-wrote with James Hutchison of the Citadel, um, well, co-edited, I should say, and wrote some of the essays in the Renaissance in Charleston, a book that came out in 2003. In fact, in 2004, he, uh, and James Hutchison spoke to the Poetry Society. So it has been um, just about 17 years uh, since his last appearance before our group. Uh, so it's about time he came back. Um, so welcome Harlan. At this point, is, is Harlan unmuted? I just unmuted myself. All right. Well, Harlan, welcome. Um, glad to see you. I, and we're going to we're going to be talking about uh, the Poetry Society for the next little while. I didn't realize I was a changeling that I'm I'm here instead of your planned speaker. So <laughs> don't put the pressure on too hard. <laughs> well, the, you you are the planned speaker now. We. we okay. <laughs> a last minute kind of thing. We, we didn't have a lot of time to prepare this, but I am confident it's going, going to go very well. Um, so why don't we just launch right into it? Tell us about the origins of the Poetry Society of South Carolina. Okay, I will. And um, before, before I do, I'll, I'll mind my manners and thank you all for inviting me. And though it's been, you said, 17 years, your memory is better than mine. I was going to say, I'm not sure I ever attended a Poetry Society um, meeting for 30 years or so. But I do have to say that the Poetry Society has been a big influence on my life because I grew up in Charleston and hopefully seeing in this um, Q&A between you and I tonight, Jim, it really did change the city. And I think the city that I grew up in um, is really the, the place it is because of the Poetry Society. Um, but talking about how it began, um, you know, when I lecture on the Renaissance, it's usually not to poets like y'all. So I have to like talk about, and I'm preaching to the choir here, you know, to try to tell people how incredibly important poetry was in this period. You know, it's right after World War I. And, you know, if you think about what was going on at the time, um, you know, certainly there were some newsreels, there were newspaper accounts, but I think it was those World War I poets that really brought you know, all of that angst and carnage and youth against age, you know, um, to the people. So poetry was incredibly important, you know, in America at this time. Um, you know, everyone was writing poems the way today, everyone's writing movie scripts or rap songs or something like that, or creating apps. 
you know, and um, so, you know, I'm using analogy <laughs> metaphors, which is your stock and trade. Um, but if you think what was happening, I don't think it would be too unusual today to have a group of friends sitting together someplace, probably in a coffee shop, working on an app and another group somewhere else working on an app and them getting together and, you know, creating something large out of that. And that's what was really going on in Charleston in the teens and 20s. On Legree Street, we had two young men, Herbie Allen and DeBose Hayward, working with an older man, um, John Bennett. They weren't working on apps. They were working on poetry because poetry was the, you know, the hot um, method, mode of communication at the time. And all of like four blocks away, this was a Victorian city, sexes were segregated. There was an older woman, Laura Bragg, um, meeting with younger women like Josephine Pinckney, Elizabeth Miles, and a variety of people like that. And Charleston being Charleston, being incestuous as it is, but also being as small as it is, obviously, the men on the Gree Street knew the women on Gibb Street. And it was inevitable that, you know, that their paths would cross. And, you know, and it's like those Mickey Rooney, you know, Judy Garland things. Hey, let's put on a show. Um, you know, John Bennett said, you know, the air was just pregnant. You know, you know, that same feeling, I guess, that creative people feel when they know that they're just on the verge of, you know, finishing something, writing a great poem or something like that. I think of the Joni Mitchell thing, you know, the dancing well you feel when every fairy tale comes real. Um, and I think I think these young men on on Legree Street, you know, were just, you know, half their feet on the ground, their 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 heads in the air. The women on Legree Street were in the same position too. And as John Bennett said, the air was full of fuel, the air was full of thunder, and all you needed was a spark. And according to Bennett, um, and again, men always get the credit, y'all ladies know that. Um, according to Bennett, it was DeBose Hayward who said, hey, let's start a poetry society. And that supposedly is the spark that set it off. But someone did later on say, um, once the society got off the ground, that because of DeBose Hayward's soft Southern accent, people were thinking that he wanted to start a poultry society, um, you know, um, for chickens and stuff like that. But anyway, that, that truly is the story of how they came together the men on the Gree and the women on Gibbs. Right, and and those those that group, that small group, com, uh, comprised most of the poets in the Poetry Society. That's a misconception to this day that the Poetry Society was a giant group of poets. Um, so they were getting together. They were very interested in poetry, um, but they very quickly assembled a large group of Charlestonians, uh, reached the maximum, they, they had a, a, a maximum membership of in-town members at 200 just for the seating capacity of South Carolina Society Hall. And they reached that pretty quickly. And I think that is a uh, kind of astounding. Um, so what, can you go into, um, to the reasons why so uh, poetry is very hot but even even for people who didn't write it and probably never would um how did how how do you account for such 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 success in in, in the early poetry society well i think i think the people that did who did start it um had tapped into you know a zeitgeist that was going on in the city of Charleston among their generation and others. And that if they did not write poetry themselves, they felt the same things that the poets were doing. Um, and again, you don't have to write apps to appreciate apps, you know, and that kind of thing, going sticking with that metaphor. Um, and so instead of talking about 1920, I'll backtrack a little bit and talk about maybe about, you know, 1880 and 1890, which is about the time that all of these poets are born. It's that decade or so. And it's 20 years, 15 years after the Civil War. And then again, the analogy that I make is, you know, think about white Russians after the revolution and think about the children of, um, you know, the aristocrats who were deposed in the French Revolution. You've got these young people growing up in poverty, but being told about how wonderful the world before them was. You know, it was, you know, it was a great world. It was a wonderful world, but these kids themselves don't know it. They've grown up in Charleston where absolutely nothing is new. And I like to use um, alliteration, you know, so they're basically um, raised on rice, ruin, and regret. 
you know, they're told by their parents this wonderful world that existed before them, and they kind of believe it. And, you know, so when they start writing poetry, it's almost as if, um, you know, and what triggers them to write poetry is, okay, what's happening now in Charleston in 1920? You know, they're raised on looking backward, but you can't look backward anymore in 1920 or so, because the analogy, again, that I use after the um, World War, it's a weather analogy, maybe the same thing that happened here in Charleston and is happening in parts of the state today. Hot and cold forces coming together. You got this cold blast from the past and you've got this hot kind of jazz age music hitting along. And you know, if you think about what's going on on the streets of Charleston at the time, there are women that danced on the walls of Fort Sumter, their granddaughters are rolling their stockings and bobbing their hair. In the African-American community, there were people who were enslaved. And there are also people like Edwin Harleston who just founded the NAACP in the city of Charleston. So you have these dynamic forces of past and present, and they're tugging at you for loyalty. Are you gonna believe in this? Are you gonna believe what your parents tell you that the past was better? Or are you gonna see what's coming down the street? And John Bennett, you know, the founder in 1919, writes a letter to his family and he says, sons, old Charleston is gone and a strange loud day rolls in. You can almost see the present coming down the street and you can look over your shoulder and see the past disappearing. And you know, it's that charged time that really ignites these people. So at first these people born in the 1880s and 90s are loyal to the past. If you look at the first poems that DeBose Hayward ever wrote, they're, they're, they're elegies to the past you know, he, um, he writes a poem called The Last Crew, and it's about pirates. It's about ghosts of pirates coming to the city of Charleston, seeing all the buildings being torn down. Shatter, shatter, shatter is the refrain that goes on. Um, and all the old walls tumbling. And the ghosts actually go back and dig up their treasure and take it from the city of Charleston. He's basically saying that the past is not appreciated here in Charleston, and we have to save it. And that's really his parents speaking. But then you know what? A few years later, there are outsiders in town like John Bennett and Laura Bragg. And they're seeing these young people, you know, just worshiping the past. And these people are kind of rolling their eyes and basically saying, you know, there's a whole new world out there. The 20th century is coming for you. And I think it's under these outsiders and insiders, the past and the present, it really sparks these people to start saying, but to find their own voice and not to speak in their parents' voice. And so then if the other people who are flocking to the Poetry Society are not poets themselves, and some of them were, they really did try to you know, write their own poetry like this. They had group sessions where people would critique poems and stuff like that. If they weren't poets themselves, they were struggling with these same issues that these poets were dealing with. And I think one, besides it being a social virtue, um, you know, to do this, you know, nothing like making a club and setting, um, setting a limit that only X people can join to make people want to join. But I do think that there was this, like I said, there was this zeitgeist going on and these poets were actually dealing with things that other people felt. I think maybe too, um, World War I, a lot of, a lot of women uh, worked. Um, there were women who became reporters, uh, you know, wartime physicians that they wouldn't have had before and then it was time the war was over. It was time to go back, and they, I, they probably could not see a, a way to go back. They, they, they enjoyed that, and then they had just gotten the vote too. Yeah, and they just started to attend the College of Charleston. I mean, women had found their voice, um, you know, and and again, so they were leaders in the poetry society. Um, I'm not sure when you got your first woman president, um, but um, was it? Well, but anyway, it was. Huh? It was it was Catherine Drayton, Mayron Simmons in the in the in the late the fifties or forties, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, again, it women were the, women women were part of this from the very beginning. Oh yeah, in fact, well, you know, by design, the mem the the leadership was was male, um, but the membership was the, that very first charter year was thirty was three quarters. It was seventy five percent female, uh, 25 percent male. And, um, and, you know, as you're talking about the Civil War, too, about uh, 50, 50 individuals were born before the end of the Civil War uh, who were members of the Poetry Society. And I think they were probably like Janie Hayward, DeBose Hayward's mother, 
um, and that kind of thing, born in 1864. Um, and they were the, the, you know, they were the generation that saw poetry slightly differently um, yeah. you know, um, from these people. And I'm looking at the screen tonight, it's mostly women. Um, and I think that's historically been so. Um, and, you know, there was, there was, it, there, it's funny, Debose and, you know, when they talked about the poetry society, they were very defensive. You know, it was the idea and, 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 you know, that, oh, they tried to prove that poetry was virile, that poetry was not effeminate and stuff like that. So the men were kind of dealing with the issue, you know, that, oh my God, we have to prove how virile we are because we're the head of a poetry society. And even Henry James at this time laments, he comes back from Europe to the United States and Henry James is saying, why, you know, why have men deserted the arts? It's only women in this country who are keeping the spirit of art, literature, et cetera, alive. He really, you know, so I'm not sure if James is a feminist per se, but he is really remarking on what's going on in this country is that men, you know, don't, you know, they think it's, they think it's a feminine, you know, they have to prove themselves in business or something like that. So to some extent it was unusual, you know, certainly it was dominant male culture, but it was somewhat unusual that Hayward and Bennett, et cetera, you know, would take these positions as, as president because they were kind of tainting themselves by associating themselves with, with the arts. Hmm. Well, you know, I think they had a vision of turning Charleston into an art colony, uh, like, like some found in Italy. Um, and not just poetry, but all the arts. And they, and, and for a while, um, the well, you made a point already that everybody knew each other. There were, uh, I think at, at the time, about 35,000 white Charlestonians uh, who lived on the peninsula. And in your own class, in your own social circles, you knew, you knew just about everybody. So- And you're um, probably related to them too. Or related, yeah, both, you know, married to your relatives too. Um, so, um, what, what are some of the other directions that members of the Poetry Society uh, took the arts in, in, the, um, in the city in that time? Well, you know, I think you're right that I don't think they set out to create an artist colony, but I think the result was that it was an artist colony because, I mean, it's so interesting that, um, you know, so other things started in Charleston at about the same time. I think people were feeling the same kind of, I keep abusing the word zeitgeist, that other people were. But the Poetry Society was the first organization to organize, um, to actually incorporate. The Preservation Society starts in 1920 as well. They don't incorporate for another eight years or so, but the Poetry Society actually incorporates they were actually active before they, you know, you know, Legree Street and Gibbs Street. So they incorporate, and that's really something. I think it's the very first time, you know, that a cultural organization is getting together in the city of Charleston. It's not a benevolent organization like the St. Andrews Society or, um, or the St. Cecilia Society. This is the first time that people are literally incorporating, become a fiscal entity to, um, do something cultural. And I don't, you know, I don't think this has happened in a generation or so at least. So, um, so, but all people are involved in this. Um, so, you know, Alston Days, I think wins some of the early poem, poetry prizes of the, of the Poetry Society. But you know what? He's also the second president of the Preservation Society. Um, all of these people, you know, not a lot of people were making money from their poetry. They also had daytime jobs. So people that were in the Poetry Society also were founding the Preservation Society. And you think DeBose Hayward, once he kind of beyond, goes beyond poetry to prose and then to playwriting, he does the, um, you know, he does the opening ode for the Dock Street Theater, you know, in 1938, 1939. And the theater is revived in Charleston, South Carolina. You know, the, um, you know, DeBose Hayward's um, mentee, Emmett Robinson, is one of the people that keeps the arts alive in the city of Charleston from the, from the Charleston Renaissance until the time of Spoleto. Um, you've also got the Society for the Preservation of Spirituals, a very interesting organization, for lack of a better word. Um, they're inter you know, and it's almost all the same membership and even all the same officers that are in the Poetry Society. They're also in the Society for the Preservation of Spirituals. Um, and 
Alfred Huddy is at the very first you know, meeting of the Preservation Society. Um, Alfred Huddy has been brought down to, to teach at the Gibbs um, Art Gallery. Robert Whitelaw is a member of the Poetry Society. He becomes the first um, director, full-time director of the Gibbs Art Museum, um, Gibbs Art Gallery. So I think you can you know, spin it out to say that this person was a member of the Poetry Society. But I think it was the fact that the Poetry Society one, as I said, incorporated and was so incredibly successful. You know, unless you're a pedant like me, you don't realize how internationally important the Poetry Society was in the 1920s. So this was, you know, the little engine that could, this was the mouse that roared. This was the tiny little organization in Charleston, South Carolina that cast a shadow over the English speaking world. You know, with the Blindman Prize, they opened up poetry to the English speaking world. You know, one of their winners was in, you know, in England who was vaguely associated with the Bloomsbury Group. Um, you know, there is a national hookup in Charleston in 1924 via the radio announcing the Blindman Prize. You know, it's almost like the Pulitzer Prize for poetry. So I think that's one thing that this, that the Poetry Society does that energizes all these other organizations in Charleston is other people see that this little organization came around in 1920. It met phenomenal success you know, on a national, mostly a national, to some extent, a little bit of an international scale. And I think it emboldened other people to think, well, if these people can get together, put out a mission statement, and within five or six years, create the, you know, achieve their mission and get such national attention, and, you know, the, the, you know, the U.S. press ate up the Poetry Society, then I think all these other organizations were encouraged as well. You know, so the Preservation Society, so the Charleston Symphony, people, people interested in the arts, people who are not interested in business and that kind of thing. So I think the Poetry Society, as I said earlier, you know, I lived in, a, I live, I grew up in a city that the, I think the Poetry Society helped shape, you know, what it started, you know, it wasn't just a spark that started this organization, you know, um, one candle can light a thousand. And I do think that the spark of the Poetry Society helped spark other organizations to, um, to, um, to, to be creative as well. Right, not just in this state, the, the Poetry Society influenced uh, a dozen uh, state poetry societies all, all around the Southeast. So right, they're also almost ambassadors, you know, people would write the Poetry Society. Oh, yeah. We do this, you know. They were based on the constitution of the Poetry Society of South Carolina. In fact, their logos, if you see all the logos and put them together, they're very similar to John Bennett's uh, Pegasus logo. They all started with the circular shape and um, they really fashioned themselves after the Poetry Society. So it, you know, that influence, that, that, um, that art colony, uh, you know, really expanded throughout the South. Um, and I guess, it, you know, it was going pretty well until the, the Great Depression came along. That greatly attenuated things. And I think what happened as well too, these poets got their own careers. You know, um, people accused DuBose Hayward of using the Poetry Society to launch his own career. But again, they're young, they're ambitious, they do this, but then they had to go off and do their, you know, and, you know, and do their work, do their own work. So, you know, so the Poetry Society to some extent becomes a victim of the success of the people who founded it. You know, they had to go off and follow their individual paths. So I think it was starting to wane. And I think poetry is starting to wane possibly too in, in you know, in depression era America. Yeah, both. The, yeah, um, the poetry was a fad when, when the Poetry Society started, and it wasn't so much of a fad when the uh, Great Depression hit and hit it with a one-two punch. So, um, I'm, and I'm glad you brought up the, um, the Society for the Preservation of Spirituals. Um, that is, I guess, okay, so for, for anyone who doesn't know about that group, it was... Um, a group of Charlestonians and or people who grew up in the low country or on um, plantations and who were alarmed at the rate of the disappearance of gullet culture um, in language and their their spirituals and and you know they like like you started with that they had a they had a fondness for uh, the the antebellum times uh, at least at first um, and so they saw this disappearing and they um, went around and collected. Um, spirituals from from ch country churches and 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 then they went around uh, 
performing these. So they weren't, um, they weren't including, they weren't allowing um, the local African-American population to perform for them. Um, it, it, it sets up a kind of a, I know there's a dichotomy there, a great deal of fondness for the African-American population but not so fond that they would want to include them um, in anything. So um, help us understand how the Charleston Renaissance uh, kind of didn't help the, the, the black population. It's so interesting. Earlier on, I talked about how, um, you know, these young poets, when they first started to write poetry, it was their parents' voices that were coming out but in the, in the Society for the Preservation of Spirituals, it was really bizarre. It was white people dressing up in plantation finery. And when they opened their mouths, it was Gullah coming out. And these people toured the country, sang in front of the president. And I think that's a little, um, it's, it's almost in a nutshell to explain what's going on here. You know, I'm not selling anything, you know, thanks for holding my books up earlier, Jim. But if I'm selling something, it's I'm selling the idea that maybe that's really is what prompted, um, you know, all of these cultural organizations growing up in Charleston at the same time, that tug between past and present. And I think you can see it mostly in African American culture, because if you're looking for the one symbol that shows the difference between the antebellum glory, you know, that their parents are talking about and the modern world that these people are inheriting, it's African-Americans. I mean, you know, you've got African-Americans are the most visible symbol of change in the South and in the city of Charleston. So you have people who were once enslaved, you know, their children or, you know, Edwin Harleston grandchildren starting the NAACP. So they're the incredible, they're the most obvious symbol of the change. And so then, you know, that's what's driving a lot of this as well, too. Um, and so then people can't help but obsess on it. And we think about the New Englanders, Cotton Mather and um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Hawthorne being obsessed with sin that comes down the original generation. These Southerners are obsessed with America's original sin of slavery, and they're not writing sermons about it. Many of them are writing apologies in their head you know, they're basically talking about, you know, how wonderful it was. I mean, if you look at DeBose Hayward and his mother, Jenny Hayward, Jenny, Jen, um, excuse me, Jane Hayward, she writes, you know, this really racist little book of poems before the Poetry Society is founded called Songs of the Charleston Darkie. This is 1914 or so, you know, and it's all these quaint things about how wonderful it was before slavery. But 10 years later, her son, DeBose Hayward, writes Porgy, which is not perfect, but it's talking about, you know, poor blacks living in, you know, living in a city bedeviled by white people with black on black crime. So people are, you know, like I said, it's the most obvious symbol to deal with what used to be versus now. I also think Charleston's a very Victorian culture and you can't talk about sex. You can't, because everyone's related to each other. Everyone knows each other, you know, you, you know, um, you know, when Oscar Wilde is, um, you know, when all is going on in Oscar Wilde, um, reporters go to the Charleston Library Society and ask, do people in Charleston read Oscar Wilde? And the librarian there says, no, we've never had a book about by Oscar Wilde. People in town are not interested in Oscar Wilde. And so then, so I think, you know, and you can see it in the career of DeBose Hayward, he never can write successfully about passionate white people. Um, he can write really well about passionate black people. So there's something really weird going on in transference, you know, that he knows, Hayward knows he's going to get slapped down if he talks about really interesting things like adultery or, you know, passionate kind of stuff among the white people that he knows. So African-Americans give these white people a vehicle to write about passionate things, which is the nature of poetry. Um, and so, you know, it's a very odd transference going on here. And, you know, the irony is, you know, um, that it's almost, they define their whiteness by blackness. And when the spiritual society writes a book called the Carolina Low Country, everything that they say 
creates the Carolina Low Country is African American culture. We're kind of realizing that today, that that's what makes us unique. But in the 1920s, you know, they could use poetry, you know, Hayward could use the poem Gamesters All to talk about, and he could show his empathy for Blacks being shot down for no reason. But poetry allowed him the vehicle to write about that, but it also was a very safe and civilized way. I don't have to, I don't have to have one in my home. So it's like I said, it's a very complicated thing, and y'all will all go to sleep if I talk, you know, more and more about it. <laughs> it it is very complicated. I did want to say, although um, the Society for the Preservation of Spirituals, uh, it, it it would be something that would be quite alarming to to see today. Um, one thing, to, to their credit, they did not do blackface. Um, it, they did dress in, in the garb. Um, and I, I really think they, I mean, it, it, came, from a, it came from a place of admiration. Um, it was, you know, it's cultural appropriation nowadays, but um, it's, it's an interesting uh, relic from that, from that time. It really is. Yeah, I think it shows them, you know, wanting to, it, what it really does, it literally shows, you know, they're not consciously thinking this. Um, they're really wanting, this group is one of the, you know, they're wanting to keep the past alive. The past is disappearing in front of them. And, you know, the preservation societies may be saving buildings and stuff like that. But what they're doing is they are keeping, you know, these old spirituals alive and they want to freeze that moment in time. You know, um, they did do recordings and stuff like that, you know, but you, um, and, and African Americans themselves were wanting to discard the past and move to the and move to the future. So they were discarding the old things. So they did manage from a historical point of view to save a lot of things that would have been lost. But you know, psychologically, what was going on in their head, you know, very interesting. It is interesting. Um, well, um, we have probably taken up as much time as we had planned with our talk. Um, it's very interesting. If anybody does, we can maybe entertain a couple of questions. Question. I believe we put them, them on, um, on um, the chat. chat. Okay, somebody okay, needs to mute themselves. Rivy, Rivy, I don't know. Okay, there we go. Um, so is there, okay, John, I don't know if there's a way to tell people how to to chat. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a question. The bottom. Oh, Ruth, if you okay. There we go. Yeah, I, I would. I would love to know when um, black participation in the poetry society was initiated, and who, if we know who it was, was it a poet? Well. Uh, um, Okay, I can tell you that it happened very late, unfortunately, very late in, um, in our history, embarrassingly late. Um, so the very first uh, Black Poetry Society member, uh, I don't off the top of my head, let me see. Um, it was in the 1980s. Wow. Uh, and the, oh, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Oh Lord. And I I was I was a member in 1998. I thought I was late. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, was it the Gullah poet? Her she she died recently. Um, mm, oh dear, I can't. I'm sorry. Her name will not come to me. Okay. Okay. So the oh, I, just, well, okay. I just thought someone would know. Actually, Jim, and I've forgotten the name too, not of that poet, but in the early 1920s, there was a very avant-garde African-American poet, and forgive me for blanking on the name. Gene Toomer. Huh? Oh, Gene Toomer. Oh, my God. Gene Toomer. Gene Toomer became, wow. he paid his dues to become a member of the Poetry Society in the early 20s. And it was John Bennett who was you know, although he was born in 1865 and he was the oldest of the crew, pretty much, he was also the most sophisticated. He's the one who realized that Gene Toomer was African American, um, and so then, mm -hmm. you know, they knew that all the people in the Poetry Society would be upset. You know, he lived in Washington D.C. Yes, they, he wasn't going to attend a meeting, um, but they did list him as a member. You can look. I think I think you know, but they did not talk about the list of mem whatever. So. 
So he was he was the member. He was a, he was a non-local member. So you're sitting in distinguished shoes, you know, if you're following Gene Toomer. Oh, oh, oh no. yeah. I mean, it was kind of it was well, not just kind of it. It was kind of shameful what they did with his membership, unfortunately. But so the first official welcomed, you know, an open arms welcomed um, black member of the Poetry Society was in 1986, and it was Ruby Cornwell. Oh, wow. She was, she was a um, civil rights activist in the 60s, and she was a singer, and she was very active in groups. She was, um, uh, I believe she was one of the founders of, uh, she worked with uh, Piccolo Toledo, and she lived to be 100 years old. She lived on Congress Street, and um, so when you think about that, that's uh, 66 years into the existence of the Poetry Society before we had our first Black member. And the first Black, um, let me get this up here, the first Black uh, poet to appear before the Poetry Society was in 1993, and that was Carrie Allen McRae. Um, so all this, you know, that's even- Thank you. That's, 73 years after the found, founding of the Poetry yeah. Society. So I just want to I just want to add that Ruby Cornwall, um, when Langston Hughes came to Charleston, yes, she met with him. I mean, she used to talk about that. And I will say too that. Yeah, I, I forget what was you know you know he came and did a book signing or reading or something, yes. and they have like the information is hanging at the Avery Center and. And he, I, thought he, I thought he came under the auspices of the Phyllis Wheatley Literary and Social Club. He did. Club. That's why I'm saying they have the yeah. thing at the Avery, yeah. the Phyllis yeah. Wheatley. But, but Ruby yeah. somehow, whether she was in that Phyllis Wheatley reading uh, club, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, but she used to talk about that. Um, yeah. And, uh, anyway. And John Ziegler and Edwin Peacock were great. Right. They were members of the Poetry Society and they entertained Langston Hughes in right. their bookstore, um, you know, the book basement. So and, and and so it's interesting that you did have members of the Poetry Society like John and Edwin, who were also members of the interracial committee in the 1940s and stuff like that. Um, and, and they entertained African-Americans in their home. They, you know, the literary thing, but again, I guess the Poetry Society did not. The great Ruby Cornwell story is when she was integrating the Fort yeah. Sumter house, um, she sure. went to the um, Rampart room for lunch. She put her hat on and gloves and, and, and the policeman said, I'm sorry, ma'am, we don't serve Negroes. And she said, I'm not planning to order one. Um, <laughs> She was great. And so then, and she was arrested and taken Close. away. With, with her gloves on, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, any, we'll just, let's take one more question and we're gonna have to get on with the open mic, which I am looking forward to. So uh, any, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all for indulging me on a passion. You're really smart to be able to control the mute you know, because I was on all night. But congratulations, you know, happy anniversary, um, Poetry Society of South Carolina. I mean, y'all have really helped change this city for the better. Well, thank you, thank you, Harlan. I am sure everyone found that very interesting. I certainly did. And um, and I am so glad that you could join us on, on fairly short notice and have this, this nice, nice talk. It really made our 100th anniversary a lot more special than than I think it would have been. So um, thank you so much. And hopefully it won't be another 17 years before you're back with us. Um, so, and and of course, I, you know, if you wanna stick around for the open mic, you, you are, I hope you do. And if you don't, if you got something else to do, um, but um, we're going to, we're gonna get this thing underway. So that our first reader is Anne Herlong Bodman. I'm very glad she can read for us tonight. Um, we've got a kind of a running joke where I always make her go first and, and now she's so used to it, she wants to go first. So Anne, I, I believe you're gonna be unmuted or uh, you're not, let's see. You're gonna to have to unmute yourself. How about now? Oh, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Harlan. Yes, I know we would never go to sleep. That was fascinating. My poem is really about last year and the isolation and maybe how we coped and maybe we didn't. The title is On Loneliness, Red Berries and Holly. They had hardly stopped walking since the month of March. Pandemic, quarantine, lonely days and lonely nights. All this time, she had watched the residents go round and round the sprawling convoluted circle at the senior living behind her villa. Did they really believe longleaf pine and live oak would connect them to heart and soul and other human beings? Early on, she had found her way down weeds and leaves and an old fashioned Charleston bench hiding among the holly. At least she had her books and sometimes she imagined characters as friends. Today, it was a glistening godlike Greek with dark eyes who offered her a necklace. It will give you luck, she said. And she stayed two more weeks in the warm, humid air among the olive trees, nothing like romance to revive what she thought was dead. And then they went to Athens. Ah, that little hotel, the one with windows where we thought we could see the Acropolis, where we made love and lay awake into the night, listening to old men quarreling out in the street. She closed her book in the middle of the chapter. How could a book and holly trees remind her of that long ago summer? Ah, a necklace, a moon floating over Santorini. <laughs> She'd come again tomorrow, bring another book, wear red cashmere among the red berries and the holly. Thanks, Anne. I could go for some warm, humid air myself. Uh, nice to have again. So our next up is Judy Isler. As I say in TV, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. And see me too? No. Well, I don't know why I disappear every time I talk, but that does seem to be what's happening. So I'll ask you to live with that. The poem I'm sharing is one that I wrote actually before COVID became part of our lives, but it seemed to me to have, have a lot to do with what we've been going through. And I stopped there to try to get the video on. It won't come on. How about now? It's on. It's Hurrah. on. Um, whether you consider the biblical story of Noah to be history or allegory, I think we all can admit that we had a lot of, have a lot in common with Noah. We've spent an awful lot of time not knowing what's going to happen stuck in a small space with their families. And we are a little luckier than he was because at least we do not have uh, enough animals in the back bedroom to repopulate the earth. The title of my poem is In Response. God spoke, Noah heard. God spoke, Noah gathered wood and pitch tools to trim and smooth, water to steam and shape the unbelieving boards into a vessel fit for life, threatening death. God spoke. Noah moved jugs and platters, meal and fodder, creatures by twos and sevens, beloved sons, wives, and other precious chattel. God spoke. Noah sealed light fate the heavy doors against his neighbors 
and settled with the others, tossed and blinking in the half dawn of their floating sepulcher. God spoke. Noah waited until it seemed that waiting was all it was to be. God spoke. Noah tore the latch work open to look out upon the nothingness of waters still undaunted. God spoke. Noah flung winged envoys out to survey and to report that only emptiness awaited, that earth had found seed and sown it, that there was now a place for nesting. God spoke. Noah walked upon the new earth, still moist and fresh from grieving. God spoke. Noah stood beneath the arc of colors in the sky and felt his own heart beat a tattoo of praise as creatures walked again on what was green and firm. God spoke. Noah sang. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Um, so Karen Ruggieri, Ruggiero, you please help me with your name when you... <laughs> you got it, it's Ruggiero. Okay. <laughs> this is something I just um, wrote in a poetry workshop with Megan Folly. It's called End of the Line. Every steely morning, I stood on that platform, head down, eyes to the ground, imagining the screech of metal on metal, Bones pinned to rails, pinned to earth, shiny with frost, warm blood staining the third rail, a rich coppery brown. Viscera spread like worms waiting for the vultures. I did not imagine the engineer's stunned face as he realized our fate or all the haunted years that might stalk him to the end of the line. Last stop and then what of his life? Those clanging mornings I thought only of myself. It was all I could do to cement my frantic feet to the platform to resist the magnet's pull. But this morning, high on Cymbalta and Boosbar, I'm stepping off that platform. I'm looking the engineer in the eye. I am not thinking of my broken body. I am riding, flying across the winterscape. The trees are brown and bare and beautiful and the grass is heavy with frost and glistening in sun. The patient vultures are still circling and I know they always will be, but this morning, I don't care. I'm headed to the end of the line. I've never wanted this more. Thank you. Well, thank you, Karen. Um, we are going to move right to Debbie Scott, who was a, uh, she was the president and immediately followed my presidency back the first time around uh, 10 years ago. Hi, Jim, just checking, can, can you everybody hear me? Okay, great. Um, happy New Year and happy anniversary. Um, I started working on a poem that has to do with what turns 100 years old in 2021. And I haven't gotten far enough with it, but I thought I'd at least uh, share the list with you because it's sort of interesting. 100 years old this year, in addition to the Poetry Society, will be Wonder Bread, Cheez-Its, Edie's Pie, formerly known as Eskimo Pies, White Castle, the hamburger place, Wheaties, the cereal, Betty Crocker, and interestingly, the word robot. So I hope that comes into a poem at some point, but it's not there yet. So I thought instead what I'd share with you is a poem from one of my very favorite authors, Stephen Dunn, um, who has read in Charleston before, but I don't think for the Poetry Society. And from my favorite book of his, The Insistence of Beauty, is a poem that I think is both hopeful and forward-looking. The stairway. The architect wanted to build a stairway and suspend it with silver, almost invisible guy wires in a high ceilinged room. A stairway you couldn't ascend or descend except in your dreams. But first, because wild things are not easily seen, 
if what's around them is wild, he'd make sure the house that housed it was practical, built two by four by two by four, slat by slat, without ornament. The stairway would be an invitation to anyone who felt invited by it. And depending on your reaction, he'd know if friendship were possible. The house he'd claim as his, but the stairway would be, design, would be designed to be ownerless. Tilted against any suggestion of a theology, disappointing to those looking for politics. Of course, the architect knew that over the years, he'd have to build other things the way others desired. knew that to live in this world was to trade a few industrious hours for one beautiful one. Yet every night when he got home, he could imagine as he walked in the door, his stairway going nowhere, not for sale. And maybe some you to whom nothing about it need be explained, waiting, the wine decanted, the night about to unfold. Thank you, Debbie. I, I like that, you know, I was thinking along those lines too about uh, wh what we're older than. Um, we're older than the Oscars, I know that. Uh, we um, were founded before there were Academy Awards. So, but I would, that, that's an interesting list. In fact, I think that should be our new slogan. We're older than Wonder Bread. I know, I love it, right? Get some t-shirts, <laughs> t-shirts made up and say that. All right, so Eugene Platt is our next reader. Um, hopefully you are ready to go. We, uh, he, I think of all the people here tonight, he's probably our longest, uh, our, I'm not gonna say oldest member, but our, our member who's been around the longest since the 1960s and he, he has read for the Poetry Society uh, several times before. Um, so Eugene, you're, we'd like to hear what you got for us. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's always been fun to participate in the open mic programs, but it's a, a special honor to be able to participate tonight on a suspicious occasion. I'd like to thank Harlan. Uh, I've learned things uh, from his lecture that uh, I did not pick up in a half century of active membership. So. Uh, and after the program tonight, I'm going to pull out of my shelf the, uh, uh, my copy of his early novel. I think it's titled, uh, Why We Never Danced at Charleston. Uh, it's worth rereading. I'm going to read one short poem titled, Our Cat Eschews the Evening News. By the way, there's a reference in it uh, to Irish whiskey, which I always sip when I'm reading. It begins with an epigraph from the book of Ecclesiastes. Our cat has choose the evening news. What has been will be again. There is nothing new under the sun. Keats, our cat is so scented, he could not care less about those troubles on the tube. Aloof, he's above a daily travails of mankind eschews the evening news. To be sure, his pieces would be appalled if he, just like my wife and I must be, so addicted to the evening news, NBC, ABC, or CBS. As she sips her cold beer, I my Irish, sweet Keats lies asleep peacefully nearby on a favorite carton covered chair, oblivious of coronavirus. In previous incarnations, this cat likely lived through countless outbreaks of these, if not of one disease, then another. Truly, there is nothing new under the sun. Thank, Thank you, Eugene. I like that. It's choose the, the uh, 
and something I think there is something new. Um, we have gone through a big news event. It's reminded me that we're 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 living in history right now. Um, you know, I'm so concentrated on the old history of the Poetry Society, but you know, we got to keep in mind everything that's happening in, in our time is is something that's going to be studied for generations to come. Um, all right, uh, Jacqueline Markham is here, and she's joining us from Beaufort. Well, that leads nicely right into what I uh, am going to share with you all this evening. Um, it is an occasional poem on the occasion of the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It might need just one little uh, footnote, depending on how much you know about her, but her nickname was Kiki, that her sister dubbed her uh, as Kiki because she kicked her feet furiously when she was a baby. So this is called Kiki's Star. I do think that I was born under a very bright star. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, March 1933 to September 2020. Thank Kiki's Star and Jupiter, no one liked her tuna casserole. Food loving children said chef supreme husband expelled her from the kitchen, free to birth her vision and ambition for equality. Thank asteroids and Mars, Ruth resisted saying to the judge, you are a sexist pig, even as a self-proclaimed flaming feminist litigating with blind justice. Knowing stars and planets aligned for her, Ruth saw what she must do to manifest her vision of equality, a strategy of reversal. What's good for the gander is good for the goose and incremental from stone to stepping stone. She navigated a legacy path hacked through the wilderness by equality foremothers, Kenyon, Murray, and Pilpel. Becoming Justice Ginsburg, she caught the women's wave as it crested and rode it to her end. All the while, neatly coiffed in a flowing black robe, embellished with pearls, a crochet collar, or roughly French jabot. Is that Ruth in the clouds singing an aria about the Constitution, holding up two parchment placards, one nonpartisan, the second equal rights for all. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jacqueline. Um, all right, Charles Watts is going to read. He is a board member and he's uh, been very instrumental in these uh, Zoom meetings. Charles, are you there? Are you frozen? Late? All right. Don't am I, do I appear frozen? It's cold up here, that's for sure. Uh, I'm going to start a little uh, depressed with death, but it'll get better towards the end. Uh, this is called When I Grow. This is a new poem. I want to be a tree trunk fallen in the forest, covered in mushrooms and lichen when I grow into death. A meadow just after mowing, pushing new flowers into the sun. I want to be reborn as a 91 year old woman who can no longer remember her joys and sorrows. I want to be her epiphany of memory, reliving it all for her when the rain begins to fall. I want to fall into the sea, burned out, Icarus in a final descent, laughing as I realize the follies that held me in the sky, the ashes of a volcano fertilizing the crops of earth. I do not wish to be reborn as an eye separated from thou. Let there be only renunciation of all that tears us apart. Let there be only acceptance that too does not exist. Thank you, Charles. That was wonderful. Um, all right, Deborah Connor, she, uh, she was the recent winner of, of the prompt contest and you got some fan mail on it too. 
I did. I'm quite honored to have received fan mail on a poem. Um, when uh, Jim announced last month's uh, poetry prompt, the year in review, I started thinking about the year and um, maybe some of you had the same feeling that at first when uh, March came along and we were shut down, um, it, seemed, it seemed kind of nice to have unscheduled time. But as the months wore on, our feelings um, often changed. I started thinking about how Emily Dickinson might react if uh, the situation were presented to her in uh, 2020. Dickinson, a lover of solitude, but maybe there is too much of a good thing. So I took a lot of Dickinson's vocabulary and images and created this poem. Emily Dickinson writes from Amherst, December 2020. It was March, the month of expectation, when I came home again to Amherst. The carriage driver kindly dropped me at the gate. I hurried upstairs. The house, the village streets, strangely quiet like dots on a disk of snow. At first, it was paradise, this solitude. My imagination, a glorious domain. Seasons passed. Happy to be nobody, I kept the Sabbath at home. Birds came and went without a backward look. Books like frigates took me lands away. My soul kept its own society. But now in the month of my birth, the wind taps like a tired man. My letters go unanswered. A certain slant of light oppresses like cathedral tunes as it falls across my narrow desk or through the kitchen window where I bake bread. There's a funeral in my brain, zero in my bones and a fly with blue uncertain stumbling buzz goads this leaden year. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> well, thank you, Deborah. That was uh, that was wonderful. When, when you mentioned baking bread, that was a, a big thing that a lot of people did during shutdown, so much so that there was no yeast available. Well, moving on, we're going to get to Susan Finch Stevens. She is the immediate past president. Of the oh, oh, you're you got a... um, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, like, like Eugene, I'm getting some feedback, but anyway, like like Eugene, my poem has something about the evening news. Does it sound weird? It sounds weird to me. There's a lot of feedback, but is it clear? If it's clear, I'll read. Okay. Happy hour. Like clockwork, white egrets roost at the hour of the evening news. We clink glasses of Pinot on the porch and catch glimpses of winged descent as though a host of snake-necked angels have fallen into the darkening trees. Their guttural squawks and croaks punctuate the TV reports wafting through our open door, the droning of the day's particular tragedies, virus and shootings and fires for which we can no longer muster tears amid hawking of SUVs and new and improved pills for pain. We are lost in this liminal space that intersects the discordant call and response of squawk and spiel. Glasses emptied, we turn our backs to the dark and raucous trees, closing the door behind us, we slouch toward the flat blue light. 
Did you borrow that line from my email address? <laughs> well, thank you, Susan. Um, we're going to go next to Lauren Rogers. Are you there, Lauren? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This is um, my latest published poetry book, Words of Encouragement. And I actually wrote these poems hoping that they would get published through Blue Mountain Art, a greeting card company. And this is entitled, Sunshine Filtering Through the Trees. I sit here at my computer, gazing out the window. In front of me, I see trees majestically towering high. The sunshine filters through the trees. The earth seems to have stood still. Nature beckons me. I answer the call to allow it to grant me peace. In these mm -hmm. times of turmoil, when the earth seems to have gone mad, the new normal seems like a scene from the twilight zone. Watch and listen for the still small voice that grants you peace. Allow it to wash over you with the knowledge that this too shall pass. The earth will continue to rotate around the sun. The flowers will continue to blossom as spring turns into summer with all, all its magnificent wonders. Each session, mm -hmm. excuse me, each season passes with new hope, bringing with it the palette of bright hues of color, purple, pinks, yellow, and crimson, as the clouds lazily float amongst the blue sky. Everything will be all right. Hold on to your faith. Just breathe. Thank you, Lauren. I, uh, I also feel very optimistic about uh, 2021. I think we are headed for good things. Um, putting 2020 behind us was a, a big step. So uh, Lydia, you're joining us, I believe, from New York City. Yep, I am. I am. You know, I was with you guys for your 90th. And now I'm with you for your 100th. And uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces. Not a whole lot, but uh, Susan. I see Susan. I see Debbie. I see Ruth. Um, Ruth Rambo. I do not see. I see Marjorie. Uh, I do not see Katrina, though her name is there, and um, I don't see Francis, though her name is there, but it's wonderful to see you, and um, Jim, you don't age at all. I don't know what you do not to age, but I don't know if you have some kind of pact with anyone, but you look great, and <laughs> keep it up, and the only thing uh, that I'm worried about is because I do live in Manhattan and lower Manhattan, a fire truck may go by at any point and drown me out or um, an ambulance. But other than that, I'm very happy to be with you for your 90th, uh, for your 100th, as I was for your 90th. Another September. My mother believed in the good and the bad, clear cut black and white back in 1957 when in black and white, we watched cowboy TV shows. A bit into the story, she'd interrupt the narrative with her who's and who's. Quien es el malo? Quien es el bueno? She'd interrupt many, many times. Though the good ones she'd guess by the color of his hat and outfit, the one in white, no? El blanco, no? The bad one, black, head to toe. El negro, no? In those days, it was easy to tell the good from the bad, but she wanted to be doubly sure to keep her good and bad in their place. Mommy was afraid for ese, Martin Luther King Jr. we saw on TV and the kids in Arkansas. 
king was el negrito bueno, still, if he didn't watch it, that negrito bueno was gonna get himself killed, was gonna get those poor nine niños, most dressed in pure white, killed in Little Rock, killed, didn't matter if they too were good, like Los Buenos in the TV shows, that he looked like El Buen Negrito, that he was a minister, hombre de Dios, wasn't good enough, Mami lamented. Couldn't he just keep good and quiet, looking like the all in white cowboys, Los Buenos? Deep down, Mami always knew who were the good. To pray was okay, but nonviolence, she feared, was asking for it. Ay, bendito. Thanks, Lydia. It's, uh, it's been a long time since I've heard you read your poetry, and it's been too long. So, and you, you always look like the, the, the height of fashion. I've never, oh, thank you. <laughs> I've never seen you look anything less than uh, like front cover of a, a, a modeling magazine. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> well, we, um, so um, Anne wanted to be first and Brian Penberthy wanted to be last. And uh, the, so he is going to finish off the open mic and then I am going to read a poem and a, offer a toast to uh, this occasion. So Brian, are you there? I am here, can you hear me? Yes, all right, good. So it's, it's uh, great to be with you all again. I've been uh, adventuring in lots of other states uh, since the last time I was with the Poetry Society, but uh, uh, you, you know you can't miss this occasion to, to share with everybody that cares very deeply about uh, the times that we uh, celebrate uh, for what art can do. So, so I got a new one for y'all. Uh, don't judge it too harshly. It's called For All the Unpleasant Dreaming. Look at you, you crooked Jane, you casualty of the enlightenment, you rabbit tempted into the deeper woods. Think of the time I called you love. The lure of sounds, our throats no longer make a purpose or because time shut them down. The overturned car, that slid into the culvert. What do you need in the air to feel at ease with longing? These still yards of January, my urge for you stripped thin by winter. What's Each not you will not know. Wow, the right cast of life. I don't know. I guess he won't. I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> From a Midwestern window. The dead of Shiloh. Every city I enter for the first time, you're already leaving me. I watched your eyes as long as I could, blinked slow to show trust, just as a cat. Now your name is full of wasps. How much fault do we assign to the Christmas cards and terse messages we messed up forever? The potholes of Savannah, the planned oak corridors, all the ways others made room for suffering. We need to stop having this fight. I can't make the words to end it, nor decipher your gestures from the lifeboat. Your kitten sleeping in my lap, soft Luna. Her morning raids on your daughter's ankles. My worry over how I could be there and it work. However much you do or don't want me. I'm a bad man. I know because you keep repeating it to yourself and your heart's not wrong. The rural highways you've driven down, unlearning me the radio voices storytelling this disastrous year. What have we known that has not been 
whittled down. For my part, I'm better after the ends of things. When bees can comfort me with their honey and brittle wings, their matted hives, their pollened affection. Thanks, y'all. Happy hundredth. Thanks, Brian. That was uh, that was great. Brian is one of our one of our best poets, and if you do not have a copy of his book Luck Town, you are not as lucky as you could be. So uh, look him up, Luck Town, by Brian Penberthy. Well, um, I think um, Harlan will understand uh, uh, what it's like to go through uh, the John Bennett papers. He uh, had to um, wade through 30 linear feet of those things to, um, to organize them in the South Carolina Historical Society's collection. And are you seeing me? I should be on, uh, okay. Um, anyway, I, I read through those for my research for, for the, the new book, The uh, History of the Poetry Society, which is in a kind of rough draft form. It's uh, in need of a of really thorough editing. Um, but um, anyway, a lot, uh, John Bennett wrote these, what he called these, um, uh, Sunday budgets, where he sat down and just poured out like pages and pages of everything that he did in infinite detail. And I had to read through like hundreds of these things because, you know, somewhere buried in all the stuff about renovation of the house and, you know, God knows what, he would have a paragraph that was about the Poetry Society. I had to, you know, that was useful. And, I, and every time I found one of those things, I thought, oh my God, now I got to dig, you know, I got to read every one of these budgets, which are kind of fascinating, but I was, you know, really only out for the, the details about the Poetry Society. But anyway, the letters to his wife, he called her Dear Heart. So it was, it was Dear Heart. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, since, since these things almost were like diaries, it's like he was also talking to himself, like Dear Heart to himself. And then, of course, his wife Susan was Dear Heart. It's his nickname for her. And this is written for her, I guess, um, in a rose garden. And I think it's very appropriate for tonight. A hundred years from now, dear heart, we shall not care at all. It will not matter then a whit, the honey or the gall. The summer days that we have known will all forgotten be and flown. The garden will be overgrown where now the roses fall. A hundred years from now, dear heart, we shall not mind the pain. The throbbing crimson tide of life will not left have left a stain. The song we sing together, dear, will mean no more than means a tear amid a summer rain. A hundred years from now, dear heart, the grief will all be over. The sea of care will surge in vain upon a careless shore. These glasses we turn down today here at the parting of the way, we shall be wineless then as they, and shall not mind it more. A hundred years from now, dear heart, we'll neither know nor care what came of all life's bitterness or followed love's despair. Then fill the glasses up again and kiss me through the rose leaf rain. We'll build one castle more in Spain and dream one more dream there. So I'd like to offer a toast to um, all those who came before us, the founders of the Poetry Society and all the people, the, the endless list of volunteers who kept this thing going for a hundred years. And here we are tonight in a situation they probably couldn't have imagined. It would be uh, some sort of science fiction to them that we were here uh, from all over um, and, and still communing together as a society. The poetry and the society still together in these strange times. So 
Here's to you and to us. Cheers. Cheers, y'all. Thank you, Jim, for being our leader in this difficult year. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jim. Great Thank job. You. Thank you. Thank you, Poetry Society. Thank you, Harlan. It was a great talk. Yes, I want. I, I want to thank Harlan once again. Um, it was I, it was wonderful. You, you brought new dimensions to that time, a hundred years ago, and brought that to life for us and to help us understand the uh, the crucible that the Poetry Society was forged in. And um, as I just said in the text to everyone, they had just gone through the pandemic in Charleston. If you read John Bennett's letters, he would have talked about that right before they founded the Poetry Society. So, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know, yeah. what comes around, comes around, a season for everything. So maybe this is for the next 100 years, going through a pandemic and a great future. Yeah, they did, they the they influenza, that's right. All right, well. Um, One quick point, Jim. One quick yes. Uh, Harlan mentioned that uh, in the uh, uh, early Poetry Society, 75% of the members were women and 25% were men. And in tonight's reading, 75% of the readers were women and 25% were men. <laughs> yeah. uh, so some things, some, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, all right. Well, um, thank you all for being here. And uh, we're, of course, going to be back again next month uh, for February. It, um, that time it'll be a, one of our regular meetings, a poet or two poets. Um, so uh, we'll be back. And then I promise, or well, I'd like to promise, I hope, um, that one year from this month, we will have that uh, gala that we have been promising ourselves for to celebrate our 100 year anniversary. And it's going to be big. And we're going to be right back in uh, South Carolina Society Hall. And I think I will be able to fill a few ghosts there um, with us. Uh, and by the way, I did want to mention this. John Bennett was the one who spoke in that first meeting on January 15th. It was uh, 4.45 PM. Uh, and it was a Saturday. Um, and he was the one who spoke. He, he delivered a, a talk about what is poetry. And he had very concrete ideas about what poetry was for and what was good and what was bad. And uh, he was quite inflexible in that. And um, I tried to read that, that talk and it was, I, my eyes glazed over. I think what we have done tonight was probably a lot more interesting than that night was for the people who were there to hear it. So um, thank you for being here and um, good night. We can stick around, I guess, to talk you, you know, for a little while. And, um, I'm going to stop the recording here so you speak freely. Just 